of us. Yes. So and uh, it's maybe only some uh, sound check that whether we hear you. Okay. Yeah, I think it's perfect. It's perfect. It's very good. So we can see you in big face perfectly. So I think you can switch now with the screen, yeah, to make this shared screen with your transparencies. Okay. You know, I think you know okay. how it works. <laughs> to here, our technician oh. knows it, it was uh, no. Uh, it's a shared screen that you can switch to the transparencies. Oh, perfect. Here it is. Here it is coming perfectly. So right on the down corner, one sees your face and the slides are perfectly matching the screen. So it's your talk, Achat. Okay. The, um, we got started on this, Professor March and I did, probably 25 or 30 years ago looking at the photosynthetic unit. And we suddenly realized that we really didn't have the... Uh, the uh, tools, the theory that would make sense, uh, recognizing that it's relatively complex. A number of things have changed since then. The specific one, let me just give you an overview of this. The, uh, what happens in the photosynthetic world is there's a lot of uh, antenna uh, compounds, and they basically effectively capture the light and transfer the light close to 100%. Uh, and take it to a charge transfer reaction, which is inside this uh, cell wall, this phospholipid layer. And this, when we finally got a crystal structure out of this, made a lot more sense. And this is the crystal structure. The reaction center is surrounded by a ring, and that ring is surrounded by a number of other rings, which are basically the, the uh, antennae absorbing light. And if we take one of these small rings and look at it, it's got a row of porphyrin rings around the top. This is the B850, 850 being the wavelength at which it absorbs light. And there's another ring fairly close to perpendicular to it that's another B80, uh, B800 ring, so it's up a little bit higher in energy. And for each one of these, there's two... Uh, um, compounds in the two rings in the uh, larger ring. Here's a better look at it. Uh, normally, this thing is put on top, as you see over here, because it's difficult to count how many there are. But this is a very symmetrical ring. As a matter of fact, the entire complex, this, uh, let me see if I can go down just a moment. Whoops. This is a crystal structure that was done by um, uh, Cogdale back in 1995. And what it's doing is showing the rigidity of these rings. And, and this ring in the center has a, a several rings around the outside. But basically, the idea is that energy is just 100% or very close to it. Very, very efficient because if, if these rings get any kind of a defect in them, they basically photo bleach and then get destroyed. So this is a view that I put together that basically shows not only this is the eight uh, this is 875 which is the charge separation the 870 is the ring around it and that has uh, eight other B850 rings around it and the the entire place is basically covered with these 850 rings and that's what has an enormous efficiency uh, the lights absorbed in the antennae uh, chromophores excitons and photons, and we're going to use this word polaritons, but we'll talk about that in a moment, transferred to the inner chromophores. Energy is processed immediately, or we think it can be stored also because of some, uh, what we thought was conflicting, but it really was just the, uh, the flexibility of this complex. And we're not going to talk about the charge separation. That's something special into itself. And... <clears throat> These photons uh, charge separation without loss. To us, was thinking we were thinking that there's got to be a Bose-Einstein condensation. There's got to be some kind of coherence of material. And here is the ring up close. This is actually drawn from the X-ray structure. And this is the uh, B870. This is the, the B875, which houses the uh, uh, separation structure. These are B850s. And has, can anybody notice anything unusual about this structure? 
the reason I asked this question is because we stared at it for, oh, six or seven months, and all of a sudden we realized these are not evenly spaced uh, materials. These are bacterial chloroform, by the way. They're not evenly spaced. They're in a dimer formation. These two form a dimer. These two form a dimer. And what this basically is, it's a charge density wave. This is a charge density wave. This is a charge density wave. This is a charge density wave. All of these B850s and uh, are charge density waves. Here is the the uh, spacing between the two magnet. Whoops, sorry. Between the two magnesium. Uh, here's the B uh, the chloroform. It's got a magnesium. It's got a porphyrin-like ring, which make which uh, with the substituents makes it a bacterial chloroform type A. And this is what each one of these are. These are the green ones. Red, gold, green, and yellow are variants of, B, of the bacterial chloroform. So what is a charge density wave? Charge density wave is something that uh, the electrons are going to follow the electron photon Hamiltonian. This is the Froelich Hamiltonian. This is a Fermi portion. Uh, this is the boson portion. And here's the interaction term. And if you go through this, uh, I'm not going to do that in too much detail, but the second term is an effective, here is an effective force constant that, because this is a changing situation as the temperature rises. So, hello? So it's due to electron vibration interaction and the ionic potential results. And here's the density, and the density basically uh, uh, is related to these changes as the temperature changes. And if we take a linear response theory, we can come back to a renormalized uh, vibration. And when we do that, we get a softening of the vibrational frequency. And if you know a little bit about charge density waves, you find out we have a cone anomaly. This is the Linhard response function, and right where it diverges, uh, which is typical of, of a, uh, a, a Bose-Einstein condensation, something's going to diverge. What we find out is that that is exactly where the cone anomaly goes to zero. And this side is an insulator, which these compounds are. On this side, it is a metal. And so you can have a transition to a static lattice distortion, which is what we think these compounds are. They're somewhere in that vicinity. And that gives us a very stable, um, a very stable charge density wave. And it has the, the temperature profile of BCS theory. Uh, there, while it has the same temperature profile, it and BCS, charge density wave and BCS superconductivity are two different things in uh, many ways. So what's coherence and how does it lead to a Bose-Einstein condensation? Well, spontaneous symmetry breaking. That's when you have a, 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 a potential that looks like this, and it would go down and come back up the other side. And as the temperature gets lowered, uh, this, uh, this, there could be phase transitions. For example, water can freeze, and when it does so, the rotational symmetry is broken by the selection of one out of the many rotations. So that just says, basically, if you're on this point and you have a little thermal uh, uh, push, you can slide down into the so-called wine bottle uh, potential, and the phase that you're at on the wine bottle potential is where you're going to stay, even though there are, could be a number of other states in the lowest uh, energy portion of this uh, particular potential. The idea then is uh, of the uh, is is that that once you've uh, chosen that. You can generate a condensate if you have uh, proper parameters, temperature, mass, et cetera. And the order uh, parameter is complex. And so there can be separated regions. Uh, and if they're separated regions with a different phase, they can do an interaction. And if they do, sometimes they can, can join together and you can get a total uh, transition of 2 pi with a, some sort of an M, which the N is going to be topological. Very similar to the, the, um, to the Mesner effect in a superconductor when you can actually wind around depending on what the field looks like. So what exactly is it? Here's a different diagram. It's a thermodynamic state created by cooling a gas of bosons. That is definitely uh, 
what's been happening in things like cold atom work. Uh, the large fraction of bosons occupy the lowest state and it becomes coherent because it's symmetry broken and macroscopic quantum phenomena exists. So this is the actual uh, TC for what the where the transition is, and it's inversely proportional to mass. This makes a huge difference, the mass. Uh, here's just another look at it. Here's the circuit. Here's the. Uh, um, this, by the way, is a breaking of the electromagnetic field. Uh, the the um, charge density wave is a, a breaking of, of the uh, translation symmetry. So here we have uh, various phases and what a phase transition does. Oh, sorry, phase, when we have the transition, it picks a single value. And because the value is frozen, the number of particles can vary. Some examples, superconductivity, BCS, high temperature, iron, arsenic compounds, excitons, although they do have a fairly heavy mass, photons, cold atoms, magnons, room temperature, these are spin components, superfluidity, and our polaritons. And I should mention charge density waves also. This basically is something that Fritz London did back in 1938. Uh, Einstein had proposed Bose-Einstein uh, theory, but he hadn't really put together all the pieces. And London, in this very nice article in the Journal of Chemical Physics, went through and drove what it took. And here we go. We go. Ah. Here we go to a uh, negative uh, one uh, as opposed to plus one. This is normally plus or minus one. We get the number of particles in the thermodynamic lim limit. We can take the density of particles, and when we do, we end up with an integration that looks like this. Uh, integral becomes a, can ultimately become a number, or, t or uh, then this becomes our transition, and this 2612 is, is, uh, comes out of a, a rather difficult uh, a Riemann uh, expansion. Uh, London does all this for you. The integral not counted for, Basically, this does not get all the states. There's a state left over, which is the lowest state. And so while these are the excited states, here's the lowest state. And when it's cooled below TC, uh, depending on mass, wherever TC is, the lowest state becomes coherent. Phase is no longer random, and it phase locks. And this is basically what it looks like. If you had a number of components and they phase locked, you could end up with a single wave function covering the entire uh, whatever the entity was. So uh, the key to that is that once you're at that transition temperature, your chemical potential goes to zero. That's why you have a, a you can put particles in, you can take particles out with a chemical potential of zero. There, there is really no cost. And it, it um, the uncertainty principle can be written in this particular way, and I apologize for that. Uh, yeah. Particles spanning inner particle distance, if one exchange becomes important. Basically, uh, when you have chunks of coherent material, they can enter, if they're in, in, have an interaction with each other, they can sometimes form just a single phase where they all have gone joined together in a pick the particular phase that's suitable. Other uh, Bose-Einstein properties, it, it doesn't take everything to be a Bose-Einstein uh, property. You can take a density matrix and something like helium, which is a fairly low uh, interacting material. Uh, and and, and um, so if you go over, we got a population. Here's the way it normally is, T greater than Tc, T less than Tc. When you have condensate fraction, your momentum is basically a delta function. And when people do cold atom studies, they take wave packets, and the reason they have to drop the temperature so low, like 10 to the minus 7 Kelvin, is because they've got big particles, cesium, things of that nature. But once they drop it down to where they get the, the Broglie overlap, they uh, find condensation uh, happens. The excitons that people have talked about in these photosynthetic um, materials, it's basically got too high of a mass, but a polariton is like a second generation of exciton. It's an exciton plus a photon gives you a polariton, and we'll talk about that. 
at room temperature. So thermalization uh, lifetime, it's in much better condition. And the B850s and 875s are in contact at room temperature. There's uh, studies that have been done, and they have Van der Waals contact. So they're very suitable for uh, coherence. The Kimball Zurich model uh, is kind of interesting in the sense that what it's basically doing is looking, it starts off with random uh, strings, the speed of light uh, in a first order transition, but that's uh, not something that someone's going to really readily measure in, a, in our lifetime or whenever. But the relevant speed in uh, condensed matter, uh, second sound, for example, in helium is measurable. And what we end up doing is we take this uh, our critical temperature, expand the free energy in an in a order parameter, which here is going to be the Ginsberg-Landau potential, uh, and here's our BEC order, complex order, Bayes, gross Pidievsky uh, equation. And when we take, apply that to the, the um, uh, Kimball-Zurich um, model, we need to rescale. And when we rescale, we can... Um, approach the phase transition, T less than zero. We always have a parameter when we get to a coherence, or, or almost always, I don't know of any place where it hasn't, suppresses the uh, spreading the velocity, the order param parameter coherence. And consequently, we have regions of ordered phase that begin to form independently, key factor independently in points of the system. And these disconnected domains continue growing and overlapping, eventually coalescing as uh, T approaches the equilibrium. But in different domains, the order parameter phases can be uncorrelated, leaving topological defects. And that's what we're looking for, things like vortices at domain boundaries. Both of these are topological entities. And so we can estimate a separation between defects by the correlation length and we ultimately end up with something that looks like this, with this being a very important parameter, this um, exponent. Uh, when we have chunks of coherence, the geodesics are the straightest curve in a manifold, and when we have bubbles of phases nucleated with random phases, it's going to follow a geodesic path, which is the uh, straightest curve, if you will. That doesn't sound quite correct, but it seems to work out. Scenario for vortex formation uh, can be three bubbles. We could have a phase, two pi over three, zero, four pi over three. But a geodesic would straighten this out and say you move from zero to two pi over three and then four pi over three. So we co covered the manifold once and we have a value of field. When we do that, the value of the field at the vortex has to become zero. And when that happens, if there's only two bubbles collide, well, we have to worry about a nucleating a third bubble or a, a vortex created. But if a third bubble arrives before the uh, vortex is formed, then we have, can have a value that's going to be topological. And the sum of these can generate a complete rotation around the vacuum manifold to infinity or whatever infinity is for the system, and the vortex is then topologically stable. Otherwise, it's not. Defect types, we have two that we're going to look at. One is a planar domain wall, and that's a wall of uh, two-dimensional wall formed when there's a discrete symmetry. And if you have, uh, by the way, the uh, bacteria chloroform A actually has alternating double and single bonds, so it very easily can have a domain wall. And when we're going to look at, at the uh, intersection of three, uh, two, uh, back uh, two B850s uh, and one B875, we're going to find that we have three entities and possibly a vortex tube there. Uh, and what I'm going to show you a little bit later, monopoles and textures that don't figure in, uh, these are diluted and uh, the topological defects textures are unstable. So our first Bose condensate is a Joseph injunction between two Bose, uh, Bose's uh, Bose, ga Bose gases trapped in a double well magnetic trap. Barrier can be solved with the uh, gross pedievsky equation for each well, and there's a classical forbidden region. Uh, basically, the folks put it together, and what they found is they, they find the wave functions in the, can overlap significantly in the forbidden region, and the current density is the typical Josephson form. 
this is uh, Brian Josephson who did this uh, shortly after the BCS theory, which sort of set things uh, on fire. A Josephson current will result in an oscillation in the atoms, and it's been uh, experimentally verified. And I've left a, a series of references at the end of this talk. Three homogeneous interacting Bose condensates. Uh, this is sort of interesting in a sense that you can create this uh, uh, sort of a cylindrical relationship between three of these entities and uh, while the equations are similar, uh, three more supercurrents uh, can, can uh, create a topological entity. But the issue there is, is, do they have enough in the coupling strength to do that? And that is the size of the coupling constant is crucial because it's got to be small to avoid the plasma state, the Josephson plasma state. So in the weak, weak, uh, uh, weak coupling limit and only stationary solutions, uh, the author of this manuscript, uh, this paper, actually, uh, article, put together uh, a case that the results of the small value come because uh, this is exaggerated. This this was assuming everything could happen. The value is calculated a maximum possible number of vortices. But as Nazir has pointed out, and this was in, uh, I mean, it's printed in the Bose-Einstein condensation book in 1995, I believe, that uh, BEC can't be formed without interactions uh, because to get that established so that it's going to uh, um, have longevity, uh, that, that needs to happen. Uh, and if the, they were larger, vortex formation would be more likely to happen in this uh, example. We're going to use this example a little bit later in our look. Uh, merging multiple Bose condensates to form vortices. Now, there have been several interesting superfluid examples. Uh, one of these is a Bose condensate, both fast three dilute ga gas uh, gaseous Bose Bose condensate in both fast and, fast and slow rates to form quantized vor vortices, demonstrating interference merging and vortex generation. That was fairly interesting relative to Nazir's comments. Uh, here is a case where they have transfer of one orbital of angular momentum. The stable flow required multiply connected traps in a condensate fraction of at least 20%, which is what you sort of see in helium. With two units of angular momentum, obviously, the, well, not obviously, but most likely it's going to split apart into two singular vortices, which it did. And KZM, the, the, the uh, um, Kibble uh, um, Zurich mechanism model. Uh, completely reversible and only topological mind winding orders remember the scaling. So the point is the post-transition ordering can be smooth and it might be regarded as a quantum analog, which is kind of interesting. Final example is a Mesner state, uh, planar circular superconductor, you know, the hole in the middle. Uh, you just wrap the material around order parameters of the complex field. Row two is the density of Cooper pairs and the phase phi. You can quench the system from normal to superconducting. Uh, it prevents a uniform phase, so we can define a topological winding number, uh, which is basically this integrated, uh, this piece right here. And the normalized magnetic flux does become a topological entity. Uh, the KZ model correlation follows, and when this assumption was carried out, apologize for the, this is a, a less than, the probability single fluxoid trap uh, extrapolated, and the issue here is, this should have been this should be a minus two sigma to fit the experimental data, suggesting small defects not um, are difficult to uh, analyze properly. This is uh, type one where you have the exclusion of the flux, and here's type two where it's going to make a lot of vortices through. And just to let you know that this N is, a, is appropriate, this is the original Byers report on the magnetic flux through a superconductor. And you can see that once you start to get to, uh, once you increase the field, you have steps basically taking you up, which represent the change in the quantum number. Condensates. Uh, if we look at Miller and other folks and work by Mackey and Bardeen, uh, Charge density wave can trap impurities, and this was something 25 years ago where they tried to work on it and figure out if uh, they could uh, end up with a Josephson-like 
tunneling and superconductors. And when they did, they realized they stumbled into some of the uh, uh, theoretical physics, high energy physics, quantum tunneling, uh, like Sidney Coleman and decay of the false vacuum, uh, which characterizes instability. Two BECs and proximity can use a Josephson junction to exchange particles, which we saw. And this theory, the idea was to get an excited state, a metastable well, and tunnel to the adjacent rings or to B850 uh, in a lower potential. Uh, and the whole idea, uh, Mackey and a bunch of other folks participated. They have a true vacuum with a soliton description and plus or minus 2E solitons. You have to create these in pairs, delocalized in the transverse direction. And basically, you end up, you end up nucleating kinks and anti-kinks with charges uh, uh, as quantum fluids delocalized between the chains. So the idea is you, ha you have the uh, angle to displace this and where the potential energy, the ith energy of the ith chain is. And this is what you end up with. We want to disregard this first term because this is basically the pinning uh, energy. Um, Miller just, uh, doesn't pay much attention to that other than the fact to plot it. We don't have to because these are perfect charge density waves in the B850, for example. Focus on quadratic uh, electrostatic energy from the charge displacement, graphs of U versus phi for phi uh, equal 2 pi n. And this is in the figure. And what you have in the figure is you have, uh, here's a false vacuum. And false vacuums can be, it doesn't have to be some special system. They can be like this because there's a potential. And here it's a quantum particle, so it tunnels underneath uh, through, through the barrier. Here we have an exchange, which this will also support, but it also will report uh, uh, energy moving to B875, where it can be passed onto the charge separation. But based on this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you've got eight B850 surrounding, so you're going to have eight potential vortices and a B850, B875 complex. So it seems likely that at least two vortex tubes are present. That's the worst possible case for what the phases uh, add up to, the three different phases, this one, this one, and this one. But when we were doing this, we finally realized that if we have a, a current established and it circulates one way and we have another current this way that's going to try to max it, it's going to oppose whatever is going to be over here. So it's kind of interesting to look at this in some kind of a special way in the sense that these are perfect charge density ways. They can also support an Ronald bomb effect. So this is uh, uh, going to be fairly fascinating. Uh, I mean, to figure out experimentally what to do. But these rings create vortex tubes, and a Ronald bomb measurement gives you a, a confirms a 2E current on these. And the question becomes: These vortices surrounding this are they like an uh, Abrikosov lattice? This is a lattice. Uh, let me go up. This is a lattice like this. Abrikosov lattice has a number of vortices where it's being penetrated by magnetic flux. So here is, a, I just wanted to focus on a charge density wave in a little more detail than the, uh, the mathematical version. Here's a metal. This is on the upside of the, the uh, um, uh, cone transition. Here's an insulator with a gap, and this gap, uh, the, the proof that uh, uh, Piles offered when he said any one-dimensional circular metal uh, system is going to have a uh, lowering of the energy by breaking the symmetry, and that's just because there's nothing here that's going to contribute to that. It's just you drop the, the uh, boundary layer, if you will, or the uh, uh, band structure and created a gap. And when the gap creates, then you have these density peaks. And here you can see that it's an incommensurate wave, but they, it will be commensurate ultimately, particularly if you've got a, a periodic structure. <clears throat> Charge density wave creates a coherent phonon wave. That's what this is. Spans uh, B850, 875 rings and opens an energy gap. So here's what the density of states are going to look like when we put all this stuff together. We've got a band gap from symmetry. We've got our 
go here in phonon, here's our charge density wave gap, and here's the reflection of that in the particle hole symmetry gap. So we basically got voids, voids here, here, and here in our density of states. So currently there's some experiments on charge density waves that are pretty fascinating, these uh, teller, um, tellurides, uh, where people are taking time and angle resolved photo emission spectros spectroscopy, performing that experiments. Ultra-fast excitation, a coherent oscillation to occupy a charge density band, and a pile's distortion were measured by these. And what you've got and what these folks are measuring is uh, two bands, uh, the oscillation, uh, the amplitude and spectral width, and they also have an unoccupied band that shifts, and all these things are in the references, and they're pretty fascinating. And basically what they've done is when you can this pick up the phase, separate the phase and the amplitude. You can modify each of these separately is what uh, the big takeaway that I got out of this. So this could be a way of looking at the complex and seeing if you can separate it. This is the uh, photosynthetic uh, process. There's another experiment where you can have a three pulse probe. Uh, you can populate the normal unoccupied charge density wave, that's the, the upper level. Extend the times, do dynamic measurements of the gap, and this gives you a femto to picosecond three pulse excitation scheme. First pulse exciting, second creating coherent amplitude, and, this, uh, and creating the coherent amplitude. The second mode repopulates the occupied state, and the third pulse repopulates the bands. So uh, you look at these things and they're pretty fascinating. Both the single particle and collective modes can be tracked. And it's an opportunity, uh, ultra fast experiment to look at the uh, keyboard Zurich mechanism. So on to polaritons. A polariton is basically a, a uh, photon or exciton or plasmon that's gonna interact with a photon. Uh, we're going to pick on excitons. It can be a photon. It can also be a plasmon. Uh, initially by Tobico in 1950, Fano and Hopfield. Uh, it's the dot product of the dipole energy, which is here. Sorry, there's a dot there. And a polarization of uh, the electric field of a photon. And when we take the electric field, and here's our... Um, our um, uh, Oh, our polarization, the electric field. We, uh, and we end up with an interaction term, and that interaction term uh, basically leads to a uh, equation where we can do a Bugalubov transformation, very similar to uh, BCS theory and others. And we end up with a matrix that looks like this. We can take a normal mode and diagonalize it, which is in the previous page. Get a bare photon frequency. We can set omega k equal to omega zero and get our longitudinal coupling. Our rabbi splitting pops out and we get eigenstates. This has been known in the inorganic, uh, inorganic polaritons, but the rabbi splittings are incredibly small. So it's very difficult to do. Uh, Frequencies close to, an, there, here is something that I found a couple days ago that I didn't realize existed. Frequencies close to an absorption band, strong uh, exciton photon coupling is shown, uh, very short lifetimes, and this was Philpott back in 74. This is done without a cavity, but the key here is that this was done with an organic material that has a pretty strong oscillator strength. So, Something that's caused a change in the late 80s. Uh, Purcell prophesized this would happen, that if we had a way of, of shutting, uh, of creating a reservoir smaller than the wavelength, we could really let the photon bounce around inside of this particular micro cavity. And spontaneous emission, when you've got an isolated atom, um, is not a problem because it's an atom vacuum system and that's what creates the lifetime, is the interaction with the vacuum. Uh, and it acts as a jack, giant reservoir where atomic except, uh, excitation uh, decays away. And so when you put it in a cavity with mirrors, you can inhib inhibit or enhance, you can do either, of uh, the spontaneous emission. And older than the cavity, it's size comparable to wavelength. 
Anna atom whose radiation from a dipole oscillating parallel to the cavity mirrors becomes infinitely long. So, what's a polar ton look like? This is the exciton level. This is the photon level. Because they have, this, have the same symmetry, they repulse. So this term becomes a mix, and this term becomes a mix. Even though when you do the, the uh, Bose-Einstein condensation and it's supposed to, your, your, your uh, momentum is supposed to be near zero, uh, the polariton sort of ignores that. But the only place energy can exchange in the upper and lower band is right in here at this rabbi splitting. Okay? So what we can have is you can have an upper level, high energy. Uh, here is some, something that you get non-radiative decay that can float, put energy into this system. And then you have a non-radiative decay that drops back down. It's a superfluid phase. It's got bound pairs of this. This is a very flexible, uh, unusual material because the lifetime is really short. Has a superfluid phase with bound pairs of quantized vortices, opposite winding numbers, which drive a phase transition to a BKT. Um, um, Brzezinski, uh, Kostelix Thalus uh, type two dimensional system generates solitons, just um, oscillations, and the ability to extend its length to the dimensions of the cavity. Now, that's pretty unusual. There's actually a sun, a, a ring condensate. They can be an expanding quantum liquid in a sunflower ripple, which, having read the article, it's, a, it's it takes a bit of adjustment to understand the uh, polariton. This was done by Weisbrook in 92, and what it basically is, it shows you what a cavity looks like. You have these distributed Bragg, uh, here's a distributed Bragg reflector, and what happens is, yeah, that basically bounces the material back. You have a cavity, and when you set your um, peak on top of the uh, cavity, uh, you can end up enhancing the uh, uh, the absorption. And here is uh, this is basically the here's your uh, quantum. Uh, this is going to be a quantum well. This is the distributed Bragg reflectors. And what happened was measured here. So basically, the, uh, uh, the you've got five quantum waves. And you've got a rather small um, um, rabbi splitting. Here is something Lidzi did in 98. And he picked one of my favorite molecules, something very similar to what we're looking at. And it has a Soray band and other bands. This is the strength of it. And when you get to resonance, you know because this the, you have a peak and a peak, and then it splits. And you know exactly where the resonance is. This is an 80 millivolt uh, rabbi splitting, which is uh, uh, was fairly significant at the time. Uh, once again, got to remind you that, that we were not going to have our, our um, momentum uh, at zero. Uh, this is going to be a large population. This is done at room temperature, not cold. And basically, uh, it's because of the polaritons, because of the the uh, photon has such a small mass. And I wanted to add also that B850 and 875s are in Van der Waals contact at room temperature. That's part of the reason you have to, in a cold atom or cold molecule study, you have to drop the temperature. So here is a problem that uh, Cogdell and others worked on. Here's what the spectrum of B850, B875, and B800 uh, entail. Uh, the, if you, he took this, what his, what his proposal was, this is the system he was working on, and what his proposal was is to energize it with two light beams, uh, three actually light beams, one to the 850 high energy, one to the 850 low energy, and one to the 875. And when you do that, he said well, he's, getting, he's getting backward flow from a lower level here to a higher level up here. And you're right on the edge of the statistics. But if this is coherent, that isn't, shouldn't make much of a difference. So looking at these levels, uh, and this being the high level intensity, and this is the low level intensity, we thought, well, if we measured the 850 peak and, and 
the other, the low energy and the high energy, sorry, high energy. We measure the low energy here and the high energy here. We've got a nonlinear splitting between these two supposedly B850 high energy, low energy. They shift according to the light intensity, which to us makes sense that this could be, uh, this cavity could have some special properties relative to the, the micro cavity that we just looked at. So is there evidence to establish polaritons in uh, the, the uh, photo light harvesting complex? Uh, exciton polariton <laughs> should be present because it seems to be the only suitable coherent structure at room temperature to absorb incident photons and deliver fast, nearly perfect energy transfer. Well, that's that's a nice statement. It, um, it certainly needs some experimental work. But uh, one of the pieces that's sort of interesting is this uh, study by uh, Dostal, uh, rapid loss of excitonic coherence between structural units, and after the transfer, the chemical potential becomes zero. Uh, this, there is a transfer that we infer from this that could be an equilibrium. Uh, the nonlinear splitting at 850 by the low density, high density uh, property described as a nonlinear splitting could be a rabbi splitting of a polar ton. The ability of a polar ton to extend its length, the size of the cavity, generate solitons, Josephson junctions, also present. Uh, you have a possibility of energy storage via the, the James Cummings effect, and that is when you have two levels that have um, an offset in the population versus the, the number of wave pieces there are, and it can go light and dark. Entanglement uh, gets quantum states confused and tied up, and Coles has actually formed a polariton but he did it in a, in a cavity, but he had uh, basically a thousand chromosomes. So the polariton formation is possible and no one doubted based on the other work that that would happen. Here though is a possible answer or, dis, or at least a comment, a, a, a straw uh, design, if you will. Here's the exciton, here's the polariton. Here is the high level and the, ah, high level and the low level. And what takes place is the fact that when you have extra, uh, uh, when you have extra light, you can populate another level and another level and another level like stairs. And so what we've done is lined one level up with the 875, one with the 850 under normal circumstances, low level, and now we have a high level. And this, what we're saying is that these three levels could basically end up interchanging energy, and that would answer how the backflow of energy happens, because they have to come back to exchange energy, it exchanges energy, it finds out that it could put a little bit of energy up higher, and so it does, and that could be part of the backflow. Nonetheless, this polariton, uh, along with possible structures, uh, uh, the bosons are restricted to regions, uh, uh, Hmm. Polar tons are considered freedom in this regard, considering distance of two or more. Uh, something strange here. In any event, the, the this uh, platform of the B850, B875, B800 seems to be very stable. And these low level and high level, uh, if it, there were low level lights, you'd probably only have two polar tons because this can easily just shift and, and this will carry the load because that high level is not going to be populated. It's going to be down here. So uh, if we take a look at how do, this might be assembled, we could take the, the light harvesting complex and its ground state and we have rings that form this particular situation. Uh, these Here's the ring with the double bonds, double alternating double and single bonds all the way around. This comprises a charge density wave. This comprises uh, vortices in here, uh, possibly something to shield from a magnetic field, maybe early in its, uh, in its uh, uh, infancy, because these bacteria are 
uh, were around. They're, they're what created the great oxygenation effect years ago when the world turned from CO2 to oxygen. These folks generated oxygen and caused the greatest mass extinction, they say, ever. And we end up with the linking these two uh, uh, N factors. Well, we got three of them, actually. And we could end up in an entanglement uh, or a storage. And here's the polar Tom model of the James Cummings system. Uh, what you end up having, if you take this particular Hamiltonian, you end up with um, steps where you have your N and your wavelength come out of phase. And when they come out of phase, what happens is you have, um, here's an interference, and all of a sudden things go quiet, and then you start your interference pattern again. And these are on the scale of the polariton, something that would, would definitely be possible because a polariton is much faster, and this is a way of storing energy and processing it later. Uh, summaries, conclusions. Uh, have we answered the article's the title, the array of rings surrounding 875 reaction uh, uh, center uh, uh, charge density waves based on their dimer structure? And the answer is probably yes. Uh, the circular charge density wave, but this obviously would take uh, experimental confirmation. Uh, each circular charge density wave is a symmetry breaking. Are these symmetry breaks correlated? Probably not when the original structure, at least that's the Keeble um, um, Zurich premise, not with the structure, but certainly later, and, and along with uh, Nazir's comments, it, it certainly would come together and form a large coherent system, if you will. Time scale of the events ranges from pico to nanosecond, microseconds. So the question is, uh, on a hot day, is there energy that can be distributed? And these systems have to avoid photo bleaching. If they're damaged in any way, they will photo bleach and then basically fall apart. And perhaps that's why there's so many. But based on our discussion, we think that coherent entities uh, they're using uh, can dominate the transfer mechanisms. They have soliton capability from a polariton to the charge density wave, which is basically a soliton transfer. Uh, smooth the chemical potential over. Yep. And there's a uh, a recent report by Kim that had seen a soliton transfer between charge density waves following the Bardeen Miller mechanism, which which would, would um, uh, be interesting. And there's a giant optical nonlinearity forming mesoscopic polariton solitons numbering in the hundreds. These are some recent um, reports, and uh, certainly they're in encouraging, but. That's basically the end. Oops. Oh, here's a comment I wanted to make in the Redfield Master Equations. Uh, an awful lot of people in this business and, uh, and look at classical and they look at Forrester and they look at quantum. Well, there maybe their quantum ought to be broken into non-coherent and coherent because Forrester has lots of issues. I haven't done work in Forrester for a number of years. You, you've got the, the, um, the heat bath that ultimately couldn't, Forrester would not transfer that far. Quantum, it's not going to be that far because it's not going to be coherent. So that's something to, to think about. And at the end, here we are. Uh, and I'm willing to take questions. Yes, thank yes, you very thank much. You very much. So I think we have no camera yet, but some applause <laughs> you might hear. No, I'm sorry, that's a camera.